But we do have in our minds, you see, the idea that nature is somehow outside us. We've got some nature in us. We say there's a thing called human nature, and mostly bad. Human nature, uh, according to Dr. Freud, is motivated by the libido. And you know what that is. And you can't trust it. In the old days, they used to beat it with whips. But Freud said, don't do it that way. You have to treat it as a good horse trainer. Trains a horse by giving it a lump of sugar every now and then. And get it controlled that way. Be kind to it. Respect it. Even though it's really very, very disrespectable. Well now, there are, as I said, in the history of mankind, three theories of nature. The first theory is the Western theory, which is that nature is a machine or an artifact. We inherit this from the Hebrews, who believed that nature was made by God in somewhat the same way as a potter makes a pot out of clay, or a carpenter makes a table out of wood. It is not insignificant that Jesus is the son of the carpenter. Our tradition has been to look upon the world as a construct. And somebody knows how it was put together. Somebody understands. And that is the constructor, the architect, the Lord God. But it so happened that in the 18th century, Western thought began to change. They became increasingly doubtful as to whether there was a maker, whether there was a God. But they continued to look upon the creation as an artifact, as a machine. And by the time of Newton, people were explaining the world in terms of mechanism. And we are still under the influence of that idea, because after all, in things like Life magazine and so on, when they give you an article on human physiology, they usually make drawings which show the human being as a kind of mechanism as a sort of factory. And they show how the peristaltic action carries the food in and how it's processed by this organ and that organ. as just as if uh, a certain product is fed into a factory, cow at one end, and it comes out canned corned beef at the other. Just in such a way, the human is illustrated. And so too, in uh, some kinds of rather degraded medicine that is now practiced, when you go to the hospital, for a medical examination, you are treated as a machine. They process you. You are not a person. You are put in a wheelchair immediately. Even if you are perfectly healthy and can walk, nevertheless they have to have you in this wheelchair. And they put you through a process. And the heart specialist looks only at your heart because he can't understand anything else. The otorhinolaryngologist, which means an ear, nose and throat man, looks at that section of you and he doesn't know about anything else. And maybe a psychiatrist takes a look at you, and uh, goodness knows what happens there, and so on and so on. Everybody looks at you from their specialized point of view as if they were a bunch of mechanics examining your automobile. Because, as I said last night, we, we just asked for this, because most of the, us consider ourselves as chauffeurs inside our bodies, which we own in the same way as you own a car. And when it goes wrong, you take it to the mechanic to fix it. You don't really identify with your body, just as you don't really identify with your car. So here is this whole theory of nature, which has grown up in the West as an artifact, something made. Now let me take a second theory of nature. This is an Indian theory, East Indian. Nature not as an artifact, but as drama. Basic to all Hindu thought is the idea that the world is maya. That is a Sanskrit word 
which means many things. It means magic, illusion, art, play. All the world's a stage. And in the Hindu idea, there is the ultimate reality of the universe is the self, which they call Brahman or Atman. That's what there is. The self, universal, eternal, boundless, indescribable. And everything that happens, happens on the self. Like you say, it's on me. It's tonight, or on me. Uh, or like we say, uh, when you hear the radio, it's on the speaker. You see, everything you hear on the radio, flutes, drums, human voices, traffic noises, any imaginable sound, all those sounds are vibrations of the diaphragm in the speaker. But the radio doesn't tell you that. The announcer doesn't come on and say every morning, good morning ladies and gentlemen, this is KQED. The following sounds that you are going to hear are vibrations of your, the diaphragm in your speaker. And they're not really uh, human voices or musical instruments, but just that. They never let you in on that. And in exactly the same way, the universe doesn't let you in on the truth that all sense experiences are vibrations of the self. Not just your self, but the self. And all of us share this self in common because it is pretending to be all of us. Brahman, the ultimate principle, plays hide-and-seek eternally. And he does it for unspeakably long periods of time. The Hindus measure time in what is called a kalpa, K-A-L-P-A. That's 4,320,000 years. Don't take this seriously. It's not meant to be taken literally. But just for an unspeakably long time, the Brahman, the self, pretends that it's lost and is us and all our adventures and all our troubles and all our agonies and tragedies it gets mixed up in them then after the period of four million three hundred and twenty thousand years has elapsed there is a catastrophe the universe is destroyed in fire and after that the brahman wakes up and says well good crazy what, the, what an adventure that was he wipes the sweat off his brow and says Let's rest a while. So for another 4,320,000 years, the divine self rests and knows who it is. It's me. <coughs> then it says, well, this is rather boring. Let's get going again. Let's get mixed up. And it does it in a very strange way because uh, the way the Hindus time it, the first period of getting mixed up, getting lost, is beautiful. That's the longest period. Everything's right. It's just life is glorious. Then it has the next period in which things get a little wonky. Something is a, vaguely out of order. That doesn't last so long. Then the next period, the third, is when good and evil are equally balanced. And that's still not so long. Finally comes the shortest period when everything bad triumphs and the whole thing blows up and we begin all over again. We're supposed to be living in that now. It's what's called the Kali Yuga, the age of darkness. And it began on Friday, February the 23rd, 3123 BC. And it has 5,000 years to run.